Hi everyone, today we're going to learn about the Sui, Tang, and Song dynasties. So when we last learned about China, we were studying the Han dynasty, and we talked about its fall due to nomadic invasions. The next dynasties after that in order were the Sui, Tang, and Song. The Han fell in 220 CE, and after empires fall, there's usually a period of civil war or uncertainty when they're figuring out who's going to be the new ruler. And so that's what happened in China. There was a period of division into multiple empires. The Sui dynasty then began about 350 years later in the 580s. That dynasty was very short-lived, and the Tang dynasty came next from the 600s to the 900s, and then the Song from the 900s till the 1200s, which you'll see after that, was actually the Mongol Empire. So some successes of the Tang and Song period. Number one, they rebuilt the bureaucracy. Remember the scholar gentry or the scholar bureaucrats had been really the hallmark of Chinese government. They rebuilt the bureaucracy, which was needed to govern this new huge territory as they expanded. The bureaucracy was also extended to local levels, which was supposed to decrease the power of the aristocracy. So rather than having the large landowners really be in charge, they wanted to have these government officials be in charge. They had a much, much higher number of bureaucrats than the Han Dynasty, so they expanded the bureaucracy as well. Another major success was transportation and communication. So the Grand Canal helped increase communication and ease of transportation and food transportation between North and South China. So the Grand Canal is this huge 1,200 mile long canal that was dug during this time um, connecting Northern and Southern China. This was really significant, especially for transportation of food because Southern China had more fertile, fertile farmland and they were able to grow more food there and then transport it to the north where there were more people living. The canal also allowed the military and the bureaucrats to move more easily throughout the empire. So as you're expanding an empire, you want to be able to move your military around quite easily in case there's revolts and you need to get them somewhere quick. And the finished canal was 1,200 miles long. It started in Beijing and ended in Hangzhou in the south. They also built a imperial communication system consisting of roads, uh, horses, runners, rest stations, like we saw, for example, in the Persian Empire. And all of these things helped them maintain better control over their territory. Another thing the Tang and Song were known for was their tribute system. So remember, a tribute system is when you have a weaker group of people paying almost like a tax, or what we call tribute, to a stronger group. So other states had to pay money or goods to honor the Chinese emperor. And it wasn't always currency. Sometimes it was just whatever products that uh, group produced. So an example, the Silla Kingdom of Korea had to pay tribute to the Chinese emperor. A side effect of this tribute system is that it stimulated trade with other parts of Asia because as people had to pay tribute and these products were moving around, people developed stronger trading relationships. Representatives from the tribute states also had to kowtow to the emperor, which is in the, talks more about that in the reading, but kowtow is when they had to bow so deep that their head touched the floor. This was really a symbol of Chinese superiority because not only did they have to bow in front of the emperor, but having to go so low to the floor that their head touched the floor is really a symbol of um, submission and humility towards the emperor. This later flipped, we'll see, and the song ended up actually having to pay tribute to the nomadic people. Um, it, it later reversed as China weakened. Another major success was agriculture. So there was a population shift south to the more fertile farmlands, and the government encouraged settlers to move to the south and develop land or clear land and start farms. They provided military protection in order to aid people to move to the south, and they also funded irrigation. So they built ditches and water wheels and terraces for farming. So they, the Song Dynasty really tried to encourage people to increase the amount of land that was under production for agriculture. 
Another way that agriculture expanded was through the use of new seeds and techniques. So one of these new seeds is called champa rice. Champa rice was um, a faster growing strain of rice. So it was imported from Vietnam and champa rice grows to maturity in just 60 days. So normally you'd plant your rice, you'd have to wait like the whole summer for it to grow and then you harvest it and then that's it. Champa rice grows so fast that you plant it and then you can harvest it just 60 days later. And that means while the weather is still warm, you can plant it again and harvest it again. So you can get like two uh, cycles of growing champa rice into one season. And so this led to a huge increase in food production. This led to an increase in population. The Sui and Tang dynasties also broke up larger estates and gave land to the peasants. So they were trying to reduce the power of the aristocracy. They wanted the power to be with the government and not with the wealthy landowners. And so they took land from wealthy landowners and divided it up among the peasants. The aristocratic power was replaced by the scholar gentry, which is the bureaucracy. So it's not as if the power shifted to the lower class people, it was still with the upper classes, just a different group within the upper classes. Another major success is trade. So remember the Tang territory on that first map extended far into Central Asia and they helped revive trade along the Silk Road. So we know the trade on the Silk Road was really active during the time of the Han Dynasty, but it had kind of tapered off as the Han Dynasty fell and China became not so organized anymore, but it really picked up again during the Tang. And China exported products such as silk and porcelain and paper. They had very advanced ships called junks, which are pictured here, which are huge treasure ships that went all throughout the Indian Ocean. Um, remember, they also are the ones that started some important navigational technology like the compass and the rudder, which you'll learn about in this unit. They traded all the way across to the Middle East with the Abbasid Empire, which was a Muslim empire. Paper money was first used in the Tang Dynasty, so that's an important innovation for trade because paper money is much easier to take with you compared to coined money. And they also had this thing called flying money, which is almost like writing a check. So flying money was a credit voucher given to overseas traders that could be turned in for money at the destination. So it's like a piece of paper that only you can cash in. So rather than carrying a bunch of coins with you where somebody could stop you and rob you, you had this piece of paper that only you, was only attached to your name that only you could cash in. And this is just a reminder because some of times when we study these things in history, it can be hard to remember that this is all happening at the same time because we study things one after the other. So we finished the unit on Islam in Africa and we learned about the Swahili coast, for example, in East Africa. That's at the exact same time that we're talking about in the Tang and Song dynasty. So all these things are happening at the same time. So it's a good reminder here to look at these trade routes and remember that China was connected to Southeast Asia, to India, to the Middle East and Africa all at the same time that those Islamic merchants are going around and the things that we just recently learned about are happening. Another major success of this period was urbanization. So during this time, as much as 10% of the population lived in cities in China. Now today, that's a very small percentage, but in this time period in the world, 1200 to 1450, that is a huge amount of people that are living in urban areas. Um, the government regulated markets and encouraged business within cities. Artisans formed guilds to regulate their industries. And remember, an artisan is just somebody that produces a product. A guild is an organization of artisans. So a guild is like all blacksmiths form an organization, all bakers form an organization, whatever. And they help maintain quality standards and they also help set prices. And they developed a new capital city, uh, Hangzhou, which had over two million people. That is a huge, huge city for this time period, and it became a very important city for trade. So China was much more urbanized than other parts of the world in this same time period. All right, remember that Buddhism had spread to China during the classical period on the Silk Road. 
And Pure Land Buddhism, which was a sect of Mahayana Buddhism, stressed personal salvation and became very popular among the masses. What that means, stressed personal salvation, is it emphasized the ability of you to end your reincarnation and not have to continue going through all of these cycles. And that was really popular among the peasants or the poor people because it promised like a good afterlife and that you could achieve that reasonably soon. Chan or Zen Buddhism was another form that became popular among the elites. So Zen Buddhism emphasized art, meditation, um, studying the works of Buddha as ways to end your reincarnation. This was popular among the elites probably because they actually had time for those things. Like they were the ones that had time for art and meditation and reading and things like that. And it also shows the influence of Taoism because Zen Buddhism was much more of like an inner spiritual thing um, where you're going to commune with Buddha and with nature. So it definitely shows the uh, influence of Taoism. The Tang leaders initially supported Buddhism. Empress Wu, who you see here, had Buddhist shrines and statues and monasteries built all throughout China to encourage the spread of Buddhism. Eventually, there was a backlash against Buddhism, and Buddhism was attacked for being a foreign religion. Uh, and that's because, remember, Buddhism originated in India, not in China, so it really had come from another country. We learned in the Islam unit that when religions are sometimes under attack or feeling pressure from other religions, they use that as an opportunity to try to change and gain followers. And that's what Taoism did. Taoism tried to emphasize uh, supernatural forces of nature to try to regain some followers as Buddhism was under attack. The scholar gentry were the major group that did not like Buddhism because remember the scholar gentry got their positions through the civil service exam and their positions were based off of Confucianism and so they did not like that Buddhism was gaining power. They also attacked Buddhist monasteries since they weren't taxed but owned a, owned a lot of land. So just like in the United States, nonprofits or religious organizations don't have to pay the same taxes. That's like what it was like for the Buddhist monasteries. But the Buddhist monasteries were very wealthy, and so the scholar gentry started saying, well, why aren't they paying taxes? They should be contributing to society. And so by the end of the Tang Dynasty, Buddhism was a persecuted religion within China. This led to the revival of Confucianism, and this, in this particular period, this is called Neo-Confucianism, Neo meaning new. And so there was a huge emphasis by the Song Dynasty on Confucianism. This focused on morality, self-reflection, and tradition. So kind of saying like Buddhism is a foreign religion, we want to return to something that is uh, distinctly Chinese. They preached against foreign intervention or influence, and they reinforced the patriarchal society, which they said was necessary for stability and harmony. And so the position of women actually went down in the Song Dynasty because of Neo-Confucianism. This is also when the practice of foot binding began. So foot binding began during the Song Dynasty. The way foot binding actually worked is that mothers would break their daughter's toes when they were four or five years old and bind them very, very tightly under their feet. Um, and they'd wrap them very tightly with bandages. The goal was to keep their feet very, very small for the rest of their life. Why did they do this? Small feet were seen as beautiful. Um, it was almost like a sex symbol for women to have these really tiny feet. It was also a symbol of status, and we have to think about why that was the case. When women had bound feet, you can see here the woman's they were supposed to wear these shoes called lotus shoes, which are beautifully handmade embroidered shoes. Um, that was a symbol of wealth itself. But also their feet were only a few inches long, and so it was very hard to walk. They could only take like little baby steps. As a result of this, uh, women who had their feet bound could not really go out in the fields and work. And so it became seen as a status symbol because if you had this done, it was clear that you were upper class enough that you didn't have to work. It also made women be considered more marriageable. So even if you were a lower class uh, family, you might want to do this to your daughter's feet to hopefully find her a wealthier husband and she can like marry up in life. So this continued until the early 20th century. It was eventually outlawed by the communists when they took over. 
How does this relate to Neo-Confucianism? Well, foot binding is definitely a method of controlling women and keeping them um, under the authority of men. And so that relates to Neo-Confucianism because that was all about returning to the patriarchal society of China's past and promoting those values like filial piety. So what happened to the Song Dynasty? Well, the Song Dynasty had trouble with nomads from the north. They could not bring the nomads under control, and the Song actually had to pay tribute to the nomads to try to maintain peace. Over time, the civil service exams became corrupt, and so the people who were getting in and getting these jobs as scholar gentry were not really um, well suited for those positions. They'd like bribe people to take the test for them and things like that. And so it led to overall laziness of the bureaucracy. At the same time, China was increasing its spending on the military to help try to fend off these nomads. And more and more nomadic groups sprung up and started demanding tribute. And so the Song Dynasty officially fell in 1279 CE. And the Ming Dynasty started in 1368. In between there, we're going to see the rise of the Mongols. And the Mongol Empire is what we will be studying next in this unit on East Asia. <laughs>